morning. My name is Amy, and welcome here on this snowy Sunday. Incredible, hey? You braved it. If you're online, you're safe at home. That's also great. We're glad you've joined us this morning. Um, we are in our fourth week of Advent, and Advent is a time of appreciating the darkness as we anticipate the light of Jesus piercing our darkness. And especially on this morning, as you heard last week, we're going to be making space for lament, maybe more than we usually do in our service. And it's a place for you, whether you've lost a loved one recently or in recent years, or you're journeying with a family member or friend through loss, we want to create space for lament this morning and for you to hold on to the hope that light pierces our darkness. And so as we journey in worship together, yeah, would you bring your burden to the Lord this morning or the burden that you're carrying for someone else and hold that to God because he's more than capable to hold our lament. So let's sing together. One, two, one. stand and sing with us that would be lovely oh little town of Bethlehem how still we see the light above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by yet in the dark street shine everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years all met in thee tonight for Christ is born
Yesterday I was on a walk and those last two lines of the verse, O come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel, kept going over and over on repeat in my head. And I was just thinking, isn't this what Christmas is about? What Advent is about? That our God would come as Emmanuel and he would abide with us. He would journey with us. And you know something so simple that's so profound that gets you again? And it just turned me to worship. And I was like, wow, that our God would be Emmanuel and abide with us. It's beautiful, isn't it? This morning, um, yeah, we want you to know, we want to remind ourselves that God cares so deeply. Our God, Emmanuel, is not distant, but he is present. The message says he moved into the neighborhood. He knows your circumstance. He is with you. He presents himself, himself with you. So hear these words from Psalm 55 this morning. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But as for me, I trust in you. Hold that thought as we continue to worship in song. Trust in the Lord. He cares for you.
clearly expressed in his coming and walking to the cross. Sing about it. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. And I'll never know how much it costs to see Let's respond by adoring Him. 
present with us in our joys, God present with us in all times, in all things. Thank you that you deserve the glory, whatever we are experiencing. Thank you that you have stepped into our darkness and we, we love you. We love the gift that you are to us. Thank you for coming to us. Amen. You may have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Peace Portal. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and here's what you need to know this week.
We're grateful to God for you and your partnership in the ministry of Peace Portal through your giving. As we lean into this Christmas season and look at the new year with faith and anticipation to see how God will continue to move, we invite every person as they're able to begin or continue the regular practice of giving of your finances as a part of your worship. To learn more about how you can give, visit our website or head to the foyer after the service and connect with one of our amazing hosts. Join us on Christmas Eve as we celebrate the coming of the King. Invite your friends, family, and neighbors to a service at 2, 4, and 6 p.m. We anticipate young families and community members attending our 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. services. So if you call PPAC home and you're able, we invite you to join us at the 6 p.m. service. Additionally, we want to let you know that there will be no Sunday service on Christmas Day, December 25th, and we will resume our gathering again on Sunday, January 1st at 10 a.m. There will be no Kids Shine classes on January 1st, but there will be a nursery open for parents to stay with their babies and toddlers if needed. A grief support group will begin in the new year for anyone who's suffered a loss and would like to learn more about grief, how to cope with it, and also find support from fellow grievers. This group will run for eight weeks on Tuesdays, beginning on January the 10th from 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the Fireside Room. Please register online to attend. This is the final week for the Advent giveaway. This week, we're looking to partner with the Alliance to bless one of their global workers in the Middle East. Take a look. Nearly two years ago, we sent a family from Peace Portal to work alongside a local church in the Middle East. During that time, some amazing friendships have been formed. Some doors for ministry have opened, and the work of the Kingdom of God is advancing. We want to continue to support the local leadership in this region as they seek to love and lead their community towards being on mission. Help us reach our goal of raising $10,000 this week through giving on our website or in person using the donation envelopes found in the back of the seats. You can return the completed envelopes to the giving boxes at the back of the sanctuary or at the Connect Centers. Please designate your giving to Advent Giveaway. As you can see, this month we have encouraged you to partner with us to raise $40,000 for people in our local and global communities as they continue to follow God's ask to serve and love well. Please make sure to get your donations in by the deadline and thank you for taking part in this different kind of Christmas giving. Well, that's everything, folks. It's Christmas week. We're so excited. Have a great week and we'll see you on Christmas Eve. My name is John. I'm also one of the pastors here at Peace Portal. And just a note on that last Advent giveaway, of course, in light of where this family's located in the ministry in the Middle East, uh, we're limited in some of the details we can share. So the third Sunday of every month, we gather to pray for this family uh, here at the church and on Zoom. So if you want to find out more information, email me. We can connect and I can share with you more a bit about what's going on over there uh, in the Middle East. Uh, but yeah, welcome. Welcome here. Like it's been said by Amy this morning, welcome. Thanks for being here. For many of us this month, it is full on. Events we attend, events we plan, Christmas concerts, evenings spent going out looking at lights, lots of fun ways to fill our schedules, things we can choose to, be, to attend and be a part of. And also a part of this season, whether we want to or not, require some things we'd rather n avoid, but you simply can't. And so lineups are longer, traffic is worse. I imagine with weather this morning, traffic is even worse. Um, if you just fly by the seat of your pants, say, for example, and try and buy Christmas presents on Christmas Eve, those bare aisles of Walmart that you're hoping to get your kids' presents look very gloomy and depressing as you walk down those. Um, there needs to be some preparation. There are things that we wish we could take out of this month, but you just can't. It's just a part of what comes with this season. And many of us this morning, 
uh, not everyone, but so, many of us here, find ourselves on this journey where we're, we're trying, we're in the process of being formed into the person of Jesus. We call ourselves Christians. We're wanting to grow in this way. We're wanting and asking God to make us more like him, to love like he did, to serve like he did, to have the kind of compassion, the way he saw people. We want that in our own lives. And there are some really exciting, fun, I would even say, beautiful ways we get to join God in that process. There's new disciplines we can uh, incorporate into our lives of prayer and Bible reading, ways to serve, places to go, communities of people we otherwise wouldn't have been a part of, but now we are. There are some exciting ways we get to join God in that transformation work. And then there are those ways that form us, those seasons of life we walk through that we'd rather avoid, but we can't. Moments of suffering, moments of loss and pain. And so this morning, we're going to sit in this place of acknowledging that and looking to the life of someone in our church and to the lives of those in the scriptures for how to journey through that together. And so at this time, I'd invite you to turn your attention to the screen to watch Ray's video. My name is Ray Cumberworth. I've uh, been around this church for many years. I love the Christmas season. It's a good time to share with friends, but it's also a little sad for those of us that have just lost a loved one. Sandy went home to be with the Lord on August the 31st. We both came to the Lord late in life, in our late 30s. We had about three years of sickness that uh, really uh, was trying at times. It was tough to see Sandy go downhill uh, after living so, so long together and experiencing things so, so much. And I always thought the treatments that she was getting would, would maybe prolong life a little bit, but unfortunately uh, it didn't. I remember looking into her eyes the night before she died and she knew that she was dying. And so we had a peaceful time together. I went to bed. One of my dogs woke me up at 3.30 in the morning and Sandy passed just, just after that. At least Sandy didn't have a lot of pain. Uh, she was able to tolerate what she went through, so that was a blessing. But, you know, I still can't believe that Sandy's gone. Uh, at night I still hear her calling. Uh, lots of tears. Uh, Talking with another uh, widower, Lyle Nelson, we both commented on how we hardly even have to uh, make our beds in the morning because we only sleep on one side. So uh, it's the loneliness can be tough at times. And, uh, you know, past memories are healing, but now it's time to move on without Sandy and just to rely on God to take me further. About two days after she died, uh, I found a book that a friend had lent her. And I got a quote from this book. It's, it's uh, by Charles Stanley. He says in his book, blessing comes only if we experience brokenness fully and confront what is that God has allowed us to be broken. If we allow God to do his complete work in us, blessings will follow brokenness. As people that are that are grieving, we, we need others around us. And I think it's good to share our grieving together, but also to, maybe we need to get out and do things together. It is a tough situation to be in, and I, the loneliness is, is incredible. But still, I know that God is with me and is teaching me, so it's, it's something that I need to experience and I like to share with others. I'm going to read a passage from uh, Matthew 1, since this is Advent time. So Advent, uh, Matthew 1 and 1. This is a few selected passages from the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Salmon was the father of Boaz, and whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, 
whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there was 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile into Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And thus fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. And in Matthew 11 and 28, a beautiful verse, Come to me, Jesus declared, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So we'll write like the candle. Thank you, Ray, for sharing your story of loss with us. And we recognize his story is one of many. And so at this time, we'll be watching a video, as we do annually, remembering those who passed away this last year. Uh, we recognize that there will be those in this room who have lost a loved one who aren't a part of this video. This particular video allows us to honor those who were a part of the Peace Portal community and journeyed through life with us. Also, this video was created like earlier this month, and so there have been deaths in the last few weeks, and so uh, those deaths will be a part of the video next year. Please turn your attention to the screen. Good morning. As we have remembered those that have passed away from this life to their eternal life with our Lord and Savior, 
Let us just take a moment of silence to remember and to pray for their loved ones who continue to mourn their loss. And would you also remember the family of Sybil Bifford and of Eli Fair? Let's take a moment. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, I say. Therefore, I will hope in you. Lord, you are our stronghold. Yes, the strong tower we run to and are safe. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, behold, you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. Father, you say in your word, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Bless those who mourn today with the comfort of your love, that they may face each new day with hope and faith in you. May these families lean into you for comfort and be sustained in this Christmas season when the memories are so vivid of Christmas's past and the loss feels so great. May their memories with time become sweet and joyful their days enriched by support and friendships, and their lives wrapped by your love and hope. We thank you that the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, gives each of us hope, even as we lament. Hope in you, hope in your resurrection, hope that we will be with our loved ones once again. Hope that you are coming again, and this is not the end. Bless those who mourn today, not only from loss of loved ones, but from other losses as well that has caused great grief. We think of those who have lost homes and necessities out of war. We think of those who have had losses of finances, those who have gone through a broken marriage and a serious health issue. We pray for those who are lonely today and feeling depressed and disappointed and discouraged. And we pray, Father, also for families who so desire that their children walk with you. We pray for the return of our children. Father, we, would you lift them up to see you in their circumstances, that you have not forsaken them. They need only come to you. Come and lay their burden down at your feet, and you will sustain them. For those who call on the Lord will be saved. Father, give them strength for the day, courage to carry on, and wisdom in all the decisions that they make. For you are their stronghold. And we ask and pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Silence. There are seasons where we welcome it. I think of beautiful road trips driving through the Rockies or northern Ontario in silence. You know, preferably there might be a good soundtrack or something, but moments of silence, you can embrace those. On the best of days, I'm okay to be alone with my thoughts, moments of vacation, sitting on the beach, quietly resting. 
sitting with a spouse or a friend, content with one another's presence, content to sit in silence. There are those moments when we are at our best or we're put in situations and places where silence adds to the moment. It enhances our experience. It's a gift to us. But then there are those moments when silence becomes excruciating, when it becomes cruel almost. We have a disagreement with a spouse or a friend and they've hurt us or we feel wronged in some sort of way and we project our complaint upon them and in return, we want an answer. We want an apology. We want justification for what they did or what they didn't do, what they said they would do. We want something to help us understand why they did that or didn't do it. And when they respond with nothing, or we send that text needing an answer, and we might even see that painful red underneath the text, but silence. We explode. Silence cannot be the answer to my problem. Silence cannot be the answer to my pain. And then you run into this dilemma. On the one hand, uh, you experience pain at a whole new level. A diagnosis, the loss of someone you love dearly, the fracturing of a friendship, systemic brokenness in a system that you face every single day. There's that reality. And and then there's this other reality, particularly for those of us who believe in some sort of higher power or the God of the scriptures, those of us who would call ourselves Christian, we know of a God who we've been told is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, he knows everything, omnipresent, he is everywhere full of love and kindness, faithful to his people. We sing songs, come let us adore him. And so we put these two realities beside each other and say that this God then should answer this pain. It's quite simple. If this is true, then this God can deal with it. That's the remedy. Silence. And in those moments of silence, We feel lonely, afraid, and vulnerable. You know, we learn a lot about the early church and the heroes of our faith, of course, through reading the scriptures. One of the problems I've gotten into at times is to take these accounts, these letters that were written, and assume their experience or disposition is the constant state at which some of these authors write. So take, for example, uh, the Apostle Paul. With great zeal and conviction, he calls the church to serve, lay your life down, engage with the poor, give generously, stand firm in the Lord, engage in intercession so that those who are lost might be brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And certainly Paul was these things, and he implored us as the church to be these things as well, but he was not immortal. And while we ought to pray and ask for the kind of conviction God gave him on the love of God and the goodness of God, we also ought to pay attention to small moments where he as a mortal human being struggled. And we are let into some of that experience at times. We read in his second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 1, verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. And sure, of course, you're going to keep reading in in these verses and in this context, Paul's speaking to what he's learned in the need to rely on God's strength in these moments, the faithfulness of God and how he brought them through this time But we don't help ourselves as human beings to assume that when Paul says strong words, like we despaired of life itself, that this was some sort of 20-minute hiccup in his pursuit to change the world. So for those of us who were here last Sunday or we heard Scott's message online, for those of us who feel completely overwhelmed and exhausted by the current situation in life, you are experiencing a shared human experience that the biblical authors talk about and that image bearers have dealt with since the beginning of time. And this is not to minimize the tragedy you might be experiencing. I don't want to even pretend to know the extent to which some of you might be suffering. 
But it is to say that in this story, the story where the kingdom of God is at the center, the story that we as a church have immersed ourselves in the last number of months, this story has space for the one exhausted and overwhelmed, and it offers hope. You know, the Israelites were to be a nation set apart, called by God to be a blessing to all the nations. And we read through that first half of our Bible, we call it the Old Testament, we read of the ways at times they did join God in his work, but sadly the many ways they resisted, uh, rebelled, and preferred their own way. And we know this, for those who've read it, ultimately this brings utter destruction upon themselves and their city. The sacred city where God said he was going to dwell in their temple, right in the center of the city, it is overtaken. Jeremiah, a prophet in the Old Testament, offers an account in the book of Jeremiah of tumultuous times for God's people, words of warning, words of lament, words depicting the situation God's people find themselves in. And after that account, he has another account that we call Lamentations, completely dedicated to the theme of lament. In the Greek translation of this Old Testament book, that's literally translated as wailings. As you enter the book of Lamentations, the context of these writings is God's people in the midst of utter tragedy. One writer, when he's speaking about what we read in Lamentations 1, says, It is the true reality of the situation without compromise. He calls it a funeral dirge. Even if God's people wanted to pretend everything was good, offer some sort of fake, triumphalistic chorus about their love of God or how blessed they were, Lamentations does not allow for that. We read in chapter 1 of Lamentations of their abandonment, their affliction, their harsh labor, distress, anger, the suffering they experienced from being violated both sexually and physically. Death and torment are not glossed over in Lamentations. Their lament is completely honest before God. And here's what's really interesting about this piece in Lamentations. It wasn't uncommon, actually, at all in that time by the surrounding culture and religious systems. That same author who I referred to earlier, Sung Chan Ra, a pastor in New York City, writes that city laments were performed as a part of the cultic ceremonies in which the foundations of the old sanctuaries were raised, just prior to the initiation of any restoration work. And so the classic city laments closed by then celebrating the return of the gods and the move towards restoration. So it was common in the ancient Near East religious systems or sects of people to lament. People did this well. And with their lament, at the end of that ceremony would kind of come this upswing to, and now the gods will return. Now the restoration process will begin. And here in the Hebrew Scriptures, in our Bibles, in Lamentations, one piece is glaringly absent. This author notes that there is no motif of the return of the gods or restoration. Lamentations exist to offer a mourning that embraces the reality of suffering. Lamentation wants the full experience of pain and suffering to be felt. That restorative peace will come, we know this, but it isn't here. And it's not just Jeremiah and that, this particular moment in the history of God's people. Hear these words. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, hear my cry. My soul is in anguish, Lord. How long, Lord? How long? Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. These are the words of the authors of Scripture. Psalms that cry out to God in moments of pain. And I think our temptation, certainly my temptation, is to run for the hills from this type of expression. You know, I've mentioned from this stage my own journey through raising young kids and helping them process the emotions they feel and feeling like I'm literally a six-year-old alongside of them, learning to process, I feel sad, I feel angry, I feel anxious. My own journey in that. 
trying to give voice and pay attention to this kind of emotions because it's part of how we work through insecurities, our frailties. And it's so important that we see it here in the scripture. To lament is necessary. To lament is to be human and to work towards healing. God does not want our empty, triumphalistic prayers. He does not require an up-and-to-the-right mentality that pits having great faith against our real and genuine emotions and our struggles. In lament, in your exhaustion, in your suffering, God draws near. God will not be put into this box where he becomes the tyrant and we project him as wanting us not to engage honestly with him and vulnerably with where we we are at. That kind of spirituality isn't found in the scriptures. Rather, what you find is human beings experiencing the real dark pain of life and not just being whisked away to some other place right away. They lament, and for some, quite a while. You know, we find ourselves at this time of year surrounded by heartfelt images, warm family embraces, nostalgia for days. And then we project that on Bethlehem. Thousands of years ago. The reality is that as the Gospels begin, as these writers begin to put on paper this arrival of the Savior of the world, there were 400 years the people had been waiting. They'd been in this oppressive system for 400 plus years. You know, we read in Matthew 1 of this genealogy, which you'll see, we're not going to go through it. um, But we read in Matthew 1 of the genealogy. You know, I found myself, even as Ray's reading it, you know, you start getting to these names in the list, and you're like, okay, yeah, just read it, like, get through them. And, and even the reading feels hard. Even that process felt difficult. Verse 17, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. You know, there's lots of beauty to be discussed about regarding this account of the genealogy of Jesus. You know, why did Matthew choose to include this at the very beginning of his account? Is he trying to show the story of Jesus as the continuation, the climax of Israel's story? Why does he include these, very, these four very interesting Gentile women in these lists? Why two groups of 14? What does that mean with Hebrew characters and number significance? All these really important things, but don't miss this. That is a very, very long time to wait silently for God. Have you forgotten us, God? Did you forget your plan? Where are you? And then... Then this flicker of light appears. This this baby is born in Bethlehem. Angelic announcements speaking to his people. God is communicating to them again. He hasn't forgotten us. Hope is on the rise. And in the face of that, the massacre of innocent children. Herod lashes out. Matthew 2 says, When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under. According to the time that he had learned from the wise men, then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Right in the midst of this Christmas story, there is deep pain and lament. Many have gone before us and walked through seasons where they just aren't okay. And in those spaces, God shows up. And in this Advent season, we celebrate that he showed up in the person of Jesus. He has come so close to us. One Christian psychologist in the States says this, which she has learned about her faith in this last while. I used to think my faith was like an epidural to take all my pain away. But now I think it's more like a midwife 
reminding me they are with you in the pain. In Luke's gospel, he writes, By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Again, Soong Chan Ra says, Lament is wrestling honestly with God. Praise, he says, will follow lament, but it cannot replace lament. Praise will follow lament, but it cannot replace lament. And it's the story of God's people throughout the generation, and it needs to become our story as well. And so if you aren't okay this morning, that's okay. Because God became man and entered into the great pain of this world, drawing near. And in this place you are in, he will meet you. And, his, and our journey becomes more about finding his presence in the midst of that than some easy answer to take us out of the pain. And so it would be unfair or unhelpful for me to offer some three quick uh, ways to deal with suffering and pain. And it's not how Jesus chooses to deal with it. He comes close. And what better time for us to say this morning, Jesus has come and he's near, and the tricky piece then becomes, you might not feel him, or see him, or hear from him. It might be utter silence. And what we've seen in the scriptures that is that if you find yourself in that place this morning, it's best to lament, to cry out to God, to remind him of what he has promised you, to tell him how you feel. This is part of our formation challenging but necessary. And I would suggest that the prayer of faith, a life of faith that we've spent the last few weeks looking about, that this is part of it. It's part of our formation. It requires that you and I walk through these seasons of darkness, waiting, asking God, help me see you. Help me to hear you. Because while answers may feel absent, maybe much like God's presence even. God doesn't just come in the flesh to be with us in a painful and broken world. He doesn't just stop there in being with us. Rather, we, we keep reading in the Gospels. And we read there the life of Jesus where he loves, heals, and corrects and has moments of pure joy and excitement with his followers and those in the towns that he visits. Quickly things seem to turn and, and he's betrayed and brought before the governing officials of his day and the sentence that is pronounced over him, the diagnosis given to him is death. And he's dragged to a cross, beaten and mocked and the Son of God in his suffering cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He laments. Christian Wyman is an American poet. He was diagnosed with cancer in the last number of years. He's, I think he's in his early 40s. He's written some beautiful poetry, some good books. He's thoughtful, uh, provoking. He grew up in the Bible Belt in the States and walked away from it all uh, and has kind of found his way back to God in the midst of this deep suffering he's experienced. And in one of his books, he basically spends the, the totality of the book uh, wrestling with why have faith at all the things he finds difficult to believe about God. It's a very honest account. And near the end, he starts to hone in on what's at the core of his belief. And he says this, I quote, I am a Christian because of that moment on the cross when Jesus, drinking the very dregs of human bitterness, cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I know, I know he was quoting the Psalms. And who quotes a poem when you're being tortured? The words aren't the point. The point is that he felt human destitution to its absolute degree. The point is that God is with us, not beyond us, in suffering. I am a Christian, he says, because I understand that moment of Christ's passion to have meaning in my own life. And what it means is that the absolutely solitary and singular nature of extreme human pain is an illusion. I'm not suggesting, he says, that ministering angels are going to come down and comfort you as you die. I'm suggesting that Christ's suffering shatters the iron walls around individual human suffering. 
that Christ's compassion makes extreme human compassion to the point of death even possible. He's saying a lot there, and he's brilliant. So I don't want to pretend to perfectly unpack all of what's there, but God is with us in our pain. And while it might seem so clearly like you are alone in complete solitude, you are not. He isn't saying it's going to be easy, but Jesus has shattered the walls of individual human suffering. He knows. He gets it. And that matters. And so hear this this morning. He is close to you and he gets it. And for those of us who've had moments of tragedy on all scales, you know that this matters. He gets it. And we know the story. We know the resurrection and the life to come. And so we wait silently for what feels like an eternity, knowing at some point light will appear in the darkness. We hold on to his presence and we ask Jesus, have mercy on us, give us eyes to see you. And where silence can be excruciating in the midst of suffering, it has the potential also to be a gift. A practice that Denise led us through briefly uh, that I think we'd all appreciate and, and grow in, or appreciate growing in, to sit with one another in our grief and pain Quietly. There'll be times where you or I get to offer this to someone, and that's all we can offer them. To sit quietly with them. To offer your presence, trusting that God is there with you and that person in that moment. And so this morning, we're going to practice that together and take a bit of an extended moment of silence. To sit with those in our community, in this faith family, in pain and to offer our presence to them this morning. Would you join me in a moment of silence? If after this uh, sermon, or after the service, sorry, there will be, you'd like to pray with someone, there will be people at the front here who would love to pray with you. Uh, that's also can be very daunting. And so there are people in the foyer and around. If they have a lanyard or you recognize them as a staff member of our church, we just so encourage you to go and uh, ask them for prayer. Um, yeah, Lord, have mercy on us. Draw near to the afflicted. Give us eyes to see you, to hear you, to know your presence in the midst of a dark night. Amen. Would you stand and respond with us by singing, O come, O come, amen.
these words to you at the end of Revelation as a benediction this morning. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen.